Thank you, Fuzzy. Just to, just to correct you, Fuzzy, they're lamingtons in Australia. Are you talking about that little dessert thing? Clearly, you need to come to Australia, Fuzzy. Um, City Gates, it's so great to be with you this afternoon. We are, this church is so, so dear to us. We were part of what used to be called Gateway, which is now combined with City Hill. And it's, it's so awesome to see so many familiar faces. Um, most have not aged. And a lot of the young people are now adults. Um, a lot of them were in our youth. And so it's really, really cool to see all of you here. Um, as Fuzzy said, we're based in a church in Sydney. God's really taken us on a journey in the last few years since we left Gateway. And we're part of a church called Grace City Church, which is also part of Regions Beyond, uh, which you're part of. And our pastor, uh, Mike, in... Um, uh, in Sydney, has been out here to Dubai a few times, so you may be familiar with him. This is a picture of our young adults group. We were on a weekend away, and um, Tom and I lead this young adults group, and we just wanted to show you a picture just to give you a taste of who we are and what the people are like down there. This is our leadership team, and um, they're a wonderful, passionate group of people who've welcomed us in so well, and we love them, and we tell them about you guys all the time. We're constantly talking about this church. It's amazing, but there's four elders on, oh, sorry, there's four elders on the team. You might recognize Mike. He's in the middle row, far right. Then there's Tom and Quinton, and the far left in the middle is Miles. Those are the four elders, and the team is just an amazing group of people. Yeah. Um, a big part of what we do in Grace City Church, we're a small church set in the suburban area, but we do a big work in the community. We have a real heart for um, the poor, and we actually have a food care, a food bank that runs on a Wednesday morning, and we have 2,000 people on the books registered. We serve over 100 families every Wednesday who come, and not just purchase um, food for very, very low prices, but also they come, and they sit in this cafe, and they hang out, and they receive the love of Jesus. They just have community there talking to our people, and it's an amazing, amazing work. And our prayer at the moment is that God would increase this work and give us opportunity to be in a larger venue, to reach more people in the community, and just have a bigger impact. So we are praying at the moment that God would provide a venue for us in the heart of DY. The area is called DY. And Tom and I actually live in DY. And this is a building that is on our radar at the moment. It's very, 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 very expensive. And we are taking a step of faith and seeking God to provide for us. And not, not in a way that we can earn the money to then pay for it, but we're seeking a miracle here. We are asking God to do something big in our midst so that his name will be glorified and we will be able to see the kingdom advanced in that city. So we'd love you guys as City Gates to be praying for us and partnering with us in that so that when it does happen, we can share and praise God. So yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I'll pray for you now. Tom's going to bring the word to you this morning and I'm just going to pray for him if that's okay. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you're here with us, Jesus. We thank you for who you are, Lord. And I just pray right now that you would minister through Tom, that your spirit would work through him, Lord. I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to hear what you have for us this morning, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? All okay? All good? Um, as, uh, as uh, Fuzzy kindly shared and, and T shared a little bit, I, I came to Dubai in 2009, um, in November 2009, as a single man, uh, a loving life, uh, moved here for some tax-free dollar, uh, was living next to the Burj Khalifa with my Dodge Charger, I was in the bars with my friends, with my mates, my rugby club, and then about six months in, God just completely changed my life. And he completely changed my, my, my traje the trajectory of my life. Um, I, I actually felt quite emotional standing at the back this morning. Um, to be with you again is, is, uh, is big. It's big for me. It's big for Tish. To be able to bring our kids back here. Um, we were married in this church in Gateway. Our kids were born into it. 
I still remember when we dedicated Jonah uh, in the church. We were in Dubai Marina Mall, and we held him up like Simba in The Lion King. Do you remember that? Anyone that was there? Uh, we have just such fond, special memories. Uh, and memories are good, but memories and sentiment is a different thing, right? If you're sentimental about something, you don't want to move on and let it go. But actually, we have deep, fond memories, but we're not sentimental about being here. This place birthed us. This place changed our lives so fully and so completely. And you, many of you, had a huge hand in that. And now we are on, and God has called us on, and we have pursued him, and we find ourselves in Sydney, Australia. And I want to talk this morning just a little bit about the journey that we've taken, uh, what has kept us on that journey, uh, and really, I want to encourage you to keep Jesus right at the center of every single thing that you do. Um, I've found in my life, I'm now 40. Yes, I'm 40. For some of you are thinking, you are all old. And some of you are thinking, oh, your life is fully ahead of you. You've got 50 more years of all this sort of stuff. Now, I am starting to think about longevity, okay? So I've been a Christian for let's say 25 years or so I've been a Christian, okay? And I realize now that what I, the, the, the infatuation with Jesus that I once had, and hear, hear me out what I'm saying, the infatuation with Jesus that I once had has waned slightly. Can any of you identify with that? This infatuation, like when you're getting married, and when I met Tish, there was just this infatuation. In fact, guys who knew us right from early on would be like, looking back, you guys could not keep your hands off each other. That's what they said. And they were like, you always had to be holding hands, or you always had to have an arm round, etc. And is it still like that? No, it's not still like that. But my love for her has gone deeper. We celebrated 12 years, our 12-year anniversary yesterday, uh, which is amazing. And she is... She is the most wonderful person. She has changed my life for the better, completely and utterly. And actually, although that infatuation is not there, the depth of the love is. And I found in my Christian walk, if any of you can identify with this, the infatuation maybe is not there, but the depth of the love and the appreciation for God and who he is has just shaped me and continues to do that. And I want to share a little bit of that with you today. And we're going to look at, we're going to look through Scripture. We're going to take a little bit of a journey, a couple of steps through the Bible. And we're going to not look at Scripture as an abstract thing where it's just words on a page, nice stories, good morals, something we can learn. We're actually going to put ourselves into it. Because actually, when you're looking at the story of Scripture, people think, oh, okay, it's finished. The story's already been written. Like the story of Christianity, I would say, has already been written. But actually, we are writing that story right now. Amen? That each and every single one of you, in your own way, in your own life, is continuing to write the story of Christianity, of the Christian faith. Until one day, we stand before Jesus in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, and we get to gaze on him fully. Then the story will be the end, right? But we walk now in light of that, and I want to show from Scripture, hopefully, how our, what we are now and what we do now impacts the way the Christian faith is being continued to be written as it goes forward. So we're going to look at three processions. By procession, I mean group of people together walking together towards something. We're going to look at three processions. Are you guys up for this? Now, in Sydney, Australia, everyone uh, is very tight-lipped, but I want to give you completely free reign. In fact, I need free reign for some amens and the hallelujahs and all that sort of stuff. Then my second preach I did there, I was like, I was like can I get an amen? And they was like, oh, they didn't really know what to do. It's just not part of the culture, whereas here I miss the nations, so please feel free to encourage along the way, all right? Amen? Yes, good. Thank you very much. I feel stirred. Right. 
So we're going to look at the first one. This is the procession of uh, David, King David. If you remember, uh, at one point in the history of David and the Israelites, they had the Ark of the Covenant, which housed the presence of God, which housed the tablets at stone, which the law was written on, and a few other odd uh, articles. Uh, And that housed the presence of God, but was taken away by their enemies, put in far distant towns, and all those towns that the Ark of the Covenant was in brought uh, God uh, cursed them and brought disease in those towns. And the, the Ark of the Covenant gets moved around from lots of different places until we find it in this house uh, of this person called Obed-Edom, who was uh, not an Israelite, who was uh, uh, also a Philistine. But God blesses him. And David decides, I'm going to go and get that Ark, and I'm going to bring it back. And this is our first procession that we're looking at and how we find ourselves in this as well. Okay, so... This is 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. And it should be up on the screen. It is great. Excellent. So now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the, law, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when he saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, he despised him in her heart. She despised him in her heart, sorry. They brought the ark they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it and David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord we'll skip to verse 20 when David returned home to bless his household Michal daughter of Saul came out to meet him and said how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today going around half naked in view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed uh, me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But these slave girls you spoke of, I will, uh, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in, in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this word, this passage, Lord. I want to thank you for your presence. Thank you that it is so precious to us, Lord. I pray you would bless this time, bless this word to us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you've got this man, David, okay? So he was a, um, a shepherd boy caring for sheep in the wilderness, sent out by his mother and father to go and uh, care for the sheep. And it was probably the lowest job. He was the youngest of that family we know. And he was shaped uh, so intensely by the wilderness time that actually as he was sent out and there was no one else with him and he had these responsibilities that he had to care for and he had to fulfill, he realized actually in that time of wilderness that he had no one else to rely on but God. And that really got into his heart, into his heart so deeply that actually when he becomes king and he knows that the presence of God is outside of Jerusalem, he is desperate to bring the presence back into Jerusalem. So much so that he goes out and he brings in this uh, this ark carrying God's presence coming down into Jerusalem and there's this celebration. There is a shouting and whooping and song. And in Psalm 24, it says this, and this commentator say was written by David at the time for the occasion of bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in. And you may well remember this passage. It says, Psalm 24, verse 7, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Recognize this? Who is this King of glory, the Lord Strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, you ancient doors. Who 
is that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. And David is singing this and proclaiming this and shouting this as the ark of the covenant comes down because for him, being captivated by the presence of God, desiring the presence of God so deeply resulted in an active expression. It had to result in an active expression. When you love something, when you love something, your actions, your uh, body, your words embody that, and they express it. And his example was worship. He strips down, and he dances, and, he's, and he dances before the ark, which for us in worship here, you know, we dance sometimes, right? But he was the king over the whole of Israel. He ruled Israel. And in those days, when you looked at the person who was at the top, then you got an idea of the people underneath. He was the example of what an Israelite was. But yet he strips down, he takes off his kingly robes, and he says, do you know what? I'm going to be undignified before the presence of God. And I'm going to dance, and I'm going to sing, and I'm going to worship. His answer was worship in God's presence. And this is not news to you. And I've been, I was in this church for long enough to know that you guys love the presence of God. It is, it is a powerful thing, and it's a, wonderful, it's a mark, it's part of your identity, really, that the presence of God is something that you hungrily desire. But actually, worship in Scripture is not always jumping and shouting and singing and being exuberant. Actually, some of David's psalms were psalms of worship, but they were also psalms of lament and tears and just pouring out the emotions of difficulty in life. So how can you have how can you have a worship that is tears and lament and pouring out troubles before the Lord and one that is exuberant and singing? How, what's the common denominator between the two? The common denominator is that actually both are raw and undignified. That actually David's worship was always undignified. Have you ever have you ever been in a situation where you feel totally, totally out of place and you don't really quite know what to do? Maybe like you join a conversation halfway through or you, uh, you're uncertain about how to act in a certain situation and you, and you make an absolute fool of yourself? Yeah? I have been in that situation many times and unfortunately mine have been mostly in ministry situations. There was one time in South Africa where I was uh, tasked uh, with going and picking up a group of people from another town. And I took the bus and I left. Uh, and it was about a two-hour drive, I think, to go and pick them up. They were coming over the border, border from Lesotho. And, uh, and I thought, I'm prepared. I'm ready for this. And I got into the car and started driving. And, about, and I filled up with petrol. And I was coming into the town. I was probably about 20 k's away. And I realized as the engine started cutting in and out on me in this car, that I'd put the wrong fuel in the car. And then I thought, oh, this is a good, I, okay, not great, but I'll call someone. Then I realized I didn't have my phone on me. And then I realized I was on back roads in South Africa, which is not the sort of place you want to be stuck when it gets dark, you know? And it was not too far from getting dark. And I stopped on the side of the road after I'd started and restarted. I was coasting down the hills, okay, in neutral, just trying to get to the bottom, get as far as I could. And I stopped, and I had to literally put my hand on the engine to pray, Lord, start this car, otherwise I do not know what I'm going to do. And after three or four times of not starting, I put my hand on it, and I prayed, and the car started, and I spluttered, 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 and it literally died at the border. And we find ourselves sometimes in life where we are so totally unprepared for what God has for us. But actually, he always brings us through. He always takes us there. But we've got to live our lives in a place where we are actually, it's okay not to know everything that's going on. It's okay not to have everything sorted, right? When we left here, it's okay not to have everything sorted because we serve a God that has everything sorted out for us already, right? And actually, when we live our lives, we live our lives in a way that demonstrates that. We live our lives undignified before God. 
to say, actually, I am willing to forget what other people think about me and willing to put that aside and be undignified before God. And David's example to us is not to be jumping around all the time. I mean, that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. But actually, his example is to us, whatever you do in your life, you do it not because of what people say, but because you're undignified before God, because you love God and it, and it wells up out of your heart and you love scripture and you love the word and it shapes you and you're captivated by this God. And you know that actually in this God, there is no one can ever, nothing can ever even come close to him. Like, I love my wife. I love my family. I love my family in the UK. I love you guys, but you come nowhere close to God. Like he stands alone and above on his own, and he is the one that we follow. Amen? He is the one that we follow, and we live undignified, undignified before him. And then you get introduced to this other character in the story, Michal. Notice Michal is described as the daughter of Saul, not the wife of David even though they were married, because she followed the line of Saul. Saul did not value God's presence. He knew where the ark was. He knew what had to be done, but he did not value God's presence. And actually, when David comes in and he's dancing, he's being exuberant, she stands there and she's like, what on earth are you doing? And now it's easier to say, oh, hey, that's not me. I'm, I'm not a Mikhail. Like I value God's presence. Everything. I will be very vulnerable with you um, and this actually happened to me this morning in the first service. I told a story about another guy, and, uh, which happened with him. But this actually happened with me in a church in Portsmouth, I remembered. And I had to repent of this. There was a guy there who stood at the front, and he, he had his arms wide open. He was jumping about the whole time. And, and, I, and I was younger in the faith, and I looked at him, and I thought come on, buddy, like, really? Is it, do you know what I mean? Like, it's a little bit too, too much, you know? And, and, it's, and I've had to go to God about this. And, and I spoke to my pastor, and my pastor said, Tom, he loves Jesus. I mean, he loves Jesus. He is captivated by Jesus completely, and that's how it comes out, and that's how he expresses it. And I, I was like, I, I've got I've to check myself here, Right? I've got to get the, you know, the little Pharisee inside of each and every one of us. Unfortunately, he's, he's big sometimes and very small the other times. But there's, there is this, this, this demand that things must be done in the right way. And actually, in God, there's, it's just undignified worship. It's just laying ourselves out before him. Amen? And then Mikhail finds this, and you actually see Mikhail... She sees what David is doing, and, and actually her story ends. It says she died childless, and that was it. Like God's blessing went away from her. God, God just, that's the end of her story. It's done. She, she's, she's, she's done. And actually, we will always find opposition. We will always find opposition when we want to live undignified, captivated lives with Christ. It's just one of those things that's going to happen. And that same battle was at play in our second procession that I want us to look at. And this is a mirror of David's entry of the presence of God going down into Jerusalem. And it's actually Jesus himself entering into Jerusalem. This is a thousand years later. And we'll know the story, right, where Jesus climbs onto the donkey. The disciples find the donkey for him, and he climbs onto the donkey and he goes down into Jerusalem. We're going to join this story further on, actually, than the slides in verse 6, which says this, The disciples went and did as Jesus, had, as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit down on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 
So we see this mirror of this procession of David where David is worshipping and you see Jesus coming down as a fulfillment of this prophecy that actually a king, the king of Israel, that would sit on David's throne forever would would also come down into Jerusalem. And at the same time as Jesus enters on the donkey, just as David did when he took off his cloak in an act of worship, people take off their cloaks and they're laying them on the donkey and on the ground for Jesus to walk in on. They cut branches and they, and they prepare a path for Jesus to come to. And it was a busy time. This was Passover time. There would have been hundreds and thousands of people walking into Jerusalem And we see the result of this, it says that the people were stirred. And that's a really interesting word. It's the same word used when Jesus dies. The veil on the temple is torn wide open. And it says the ground shakes and the dead rose up and went out into the city. It's the same word there that the ground shook. Actually, when Jesus went in, it says the people were shaken. We get our word seismic from that same word. It's like the earthquake that rocked the norm in Jerusalem at that time. It's literally, as Jesus came in, he is shaking and stirring the people of God, the Israelites, and he's changing the social and political and religious landscape. He is moving out the old and bringing in the new of this new covenant. And this procession of kingship of Jesus coming down into Jerusalem, as David's was worship, as David's was huge and uh, spectacular, actually Jesus coming in is a procession of suffering because he's initiating something. He's initiating something powerful that Paul then picks up on in our third procession. And I want to look at that and spend some time going through this. So Paul says this, In verse 14, we're going to start there, says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life, and who is equal to such a task? So we had David's procession coming into Jerusalem, and now we, uh, and then we had uh, Jesus' procession coming, and now we have our procession that we're in. Because Paul says, actually, this procession is still happening. He is a captive in that, and actually, we ourselves find ourselves put into this story right here because we are still part of that procession right now. Now you're asking, in your mind maybe, hopefully, you're asking, what on earth is this procession? It's the procession of the new covenant. Paul says himself, uh, for, uh, further down, maybe three or four verses later, he says that actually this is, uh, the church there is a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. He's referencing directly from Jeremiah 31 that's actually a prophecy about this new covenant that God would put in place. He's saying, actually, this is the new covenant has started. And then he says further down in verse 6 that he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Actually, this procession of Christ is the procession of the new covenant. It is the moving out of the old and coming in of the new. It is, the, is, it is doing away with the law. Do you remember, he was shaking the religious territory at the time. It's doing away with the law and in with grace. Doing away with worship that was distant and, and accepting worship that is close. Do you know when, when David actually brought the ark into Jerusalem, in verse 17 in, in 2 Samuel 6, it actually says that he brought the ark into and put it into the tent that he made. He didn't put it into the tabernacle of God. He put it into his own tent. And David's tent was different because David's tent had no veil. It was literally just the ark there and a covering over the top. And when the people came and brought their sacrifices, brought their worship, they worshipped right in front of the presence of God. It wasn't the priests only that could go in. It wasn't the priests only that could see 
the presence of God. It was the whole people that would see the presence of God. In fact, David's worship was a precursor to our worship now. Because church, we don't have to. You don't have to come through a priest. There's no veil in between you and the presence of God. It is right here around. In fact, it lives within you. Because the Spirit comes and lives within us when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And Paul got this. He understood this point. Because he refers to himself in this procession as a captive. How can you be a captive? But actually, he had realized that he was so captivated by Christ that he became a captive of Christ. That he was so focused and fixed on him and so in love with him that actually he became captive to every single thing that he wanted him to do. He understood, just as Jesus spoke before he came on his triumphal entry, he understood that actually Jesus was going to give his life as a ransom for many, it says in chapter 20 of Matthew. He also understood, as Paul wrote just earlier in 2 Corinthians, that actually now it is God who makes us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And actually part of realizing our place in Christ's procession now is to realize that we are captives to Christ. Part of the issue is that we still think that our life is our own, but actually Christ has paid the price for us. He has ransomed us, and he has put us his seal of ownership on us. And church, this is offensive to some people, because they would think, oh, hold on a second, how, would, how does Christ own me? I am my own person. I shall do what I want when I want. I shall go wherever I shall do what I want. But actually, church, the more we realize and the sooner we realize that actually we are captives to Christ, that he has bought us completely and fully, and that we can walk as willing captives in Christ's new covenant procession, we will experience the blessing of God. We will see the heavens open. We will see wonderful things in this covenant. But we have to understand our status now. Yes, we are sons. Yes, we are loved but we are captive to Christ. And we, Tisha and I worked this out early on, actually. As we, are, we walk captive to Christ, actually, we see him come through so many times. We've seen him come through so many times in our move to Australia in particular. But there's this weird part of this story that Paul puts us into and says, you are now this. And it's the idea of being captive, but it's also this idea of this aroma now, I've heard stories of the aroma outside this building before, of your cumin aroma, okay? Now, aromas ev evoke certain memories. My, my, I would say the, the aroma that evokes the closest memory for me uh, is, is a strange one, so bear with me. It is the smell of chopped wood and petrol, gasoline mixed together, okay? And that's an odd one, right? You would, you would think I'm talking about like a burning building, like I've got some traumatic thing in my history where this wooden building burned down. It's not that. I used to, when I was a small boy, I would go with my two brothers and to my grandparents' house. And the thing that we would do together as a family would be to do logging. So they would have a chainsaw, and, which you would put the petrol into, and you would have to pull it three or four times. And as my granddad got old, us boys we stepped in and we're going to start the chainsaw. And I, I once got to try the chainsaw, but then I realized there was a seniority thing with this, that actually my granddad was the one that operated the chainsaw. I was the one that picked up the logs from one place and put them to another. I got the boring job. I can't believe it, right? And then we discovered axes, but that's a completely different story. But that's the, that's the smell that brings back the memory for me. And Jesus here, or sorry, Paul in here in this passage says that you are the smell that brings a memory back to people. You are the smell that evokes a memory. And what he's really referring to is this thing called the pompa triumphalis. Can you say pompa triumphalis? Okay, so that is a Roman phrase, and it based, there's 300 instances in Scripture, of, uh, sorry, not in Scripture, in history of this being recorded. And what it is, is when a general 
would conquer a, 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 a like a, in, the, in the Roman army would conquer a, conquer a people group or a city. They would have this procession coming back into the main place where they lived. And at the start of this procession, at the front, there would be a number of people holding huge, big placards. And on the placards would be written the, the people groups, you know, maybe the Germanic people or people in uh, Greece or people in probably England, let's be honest. They conquered England as well, right? Um, the, they got us back. So um, they would be written on these boards, and there'd be a number of these. And then next would be they would have this, uh, this group of white bulls, which they would sacrifice. Uh, and then after that would be the captives that they had, um, they had got hold of. So they would be the leaders. The leaders would be taken into the city, and then they would be taken off and slaughtered. And next there would be the other people, the normal people, and they would be enslaved as slaves. And then after them... After them came hundreds of incense burners, and they would be burning this thick, almost similar to what you get in the malls here, this thick oud, this thick smoke of incense would go with this procession going in. And then you'd have the generals or the king or whoever it was afterwards. And when Paul says that we are captives in Christ's procession and that we are the aroma of Christ to those around us, invoking the memories of life and death, to those that we meet, what he means is as that incense swelled up, as that incense grew and spread out into the whole city, everyone in the city who were Roman, they would be rejoicing. It's life, it's victory, it's fantastic. But bear in mind all the other people, the captives in the procession, that to them was the smell of death. So us as Aromas, when we walk and wherever we go, when we're in our families and our workplace, in our homes, we realize that actually as we walk, as we are captivated by Christ, we actually give off an aroma, an aroma of life or an aroma of death. And I'm tempted at this point to ask you, what aroma are you giving off? But that's probably a bit of a personal question, let's be honest, okay? But as Christians, as people captivated by Christ, we must understand that actually we give this off and we are this sweet smell to those around us. You know, Michal, Michal, the smell of David that he gave off with his dancing and his exuberance, actually that was death to Michal, remember? Her story ended. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, it was Worship and it was singing and it was result, it was a resounding success for most, but actually the Pharisees were there and it was death for them, death to their way. And actually, as we walk now, as we walk now, we walk as a life giving, as life giving smell to those around us. Amen. And Paul, in this passage, you've got to realize he's saying. I'm in Christ's triumphant procession. But he was actually sitting in house arrest. He was writing this in house arrest, waiting to see Caesar, waiting for his death. How can he say that, that he's a captive to Christ? Because he knew that once you are captive to Christ, you're willing to go to the very end. You are really, you're willing to walk with Christ to the very end. And that's what he had. So we find ourselves, me and you, as part of this procession right now. Part of this procession, and I'd ask you, where is the end of this procession? Where is it leading to? Are we just kind of following Jesus? That's it. This is leading to that final entry into the new Jerusalem. Just as, just as David entered the city of God, Jerusalem, just as Jesus entered Jerusalem, we are heading to the new Jerusalem where we will see Jesus all over again. And we'll be able to be fully and completely 100% captivated by him there. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's what we're going for. That's what we're heading towards, guys. So I want to give you just a few things, practical things that God really spoke to me about as we end. A few practical things of what it means to be captivated by God. To be captivated by Christ means that one day we will face opposition. There will automatically be those who do not like the smell that we give off as those captivated by Christ. And they will come to us and say, whatever it is. Now, growing up in the UK, this is, not a, this is just my experience, so I can only speak to my experience. But my experience of those that I encountered was sometimes, even Christians, was it's okay to be a Christian, that's really, really good, but just don't take it too seriously. 
And in my mind, I'm thinking, but if I believe this, if this is in my bones, if I believe that I was dead and Christ resurrected me, if like I was Lazarus and I had no means of resurrecting, of raising myself to life again, but actually Christ called me and he raised me to life. He is my life. Like he gave me life, he is my life. There's no other choice. Like this is the one that I follow. This is the decision that I've made. And it's, it's, it's costly. Like it, it, we find it costly. I've missed numerous family events. I've met some of my nephews. I'm, you know, but there's a cost. But I'm captivated because I'm captive to Christ. Like he's bought me, he's got me, and that's it. And, and my prayer is that my kids understand that same thing. It means that when we walk, we walk undignified before God, before man. And that's hard. That's hard. If you find yourself, if you know yourself and you know that you're a, a bit of a people pleaser, I found that in my life as well. It's hard to put what people think to one side and to walk fully focused on the Lord. But actually, if we do that, church, we see, I want to say I'm a wealthy man. I'm a wealthy man. I don't have a lot of money, but I am an incredibly wealthy man. God has blessed me so much. And I think if we are willing to walk with God, we'll see his blessing. It means that we walk in humility. We go wherever, whenever God calls us to go. And God spoke to us from Psalm 2.8. It says this in Psalm 2.8, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. And God spoke that to us when we were preparing to move out of Dubai. We felt God say, you need to up sticks, you need to move. I spoke to Pete Vaughan and said, I'm going to be leaving uh, employment of the church. And we shared some tears. Uh, he said, go and do what God's called you to do. And uh, we moved and we packed up. Uh, we left half of our belongings at uh, Anushka and Rohit's house. I don't know if you know them. It literally stayed there for two years because we didn't know where we were going to go. We can't carry it all around with us. And God took us on this circuitous journey, but it was all for the fact that we knew the promise in our hearts that he would give us the ends of the earth as our possession. And we found ourselves at the ends of the earth. Now, if you say to an Aussie that Australia is the end of the earth, they get quite offended. So I worked that out the hard way. For them, Australia is the center of the universe. But if you went any further, you would be in New Zealand and then Antarctica. So it is the end of the earth as far as I'm concerned. And when you're on a flight for 22 hours, it feels like the end of the earth. I'll tell you that much. But actually, I want to ask you, are you willing to go wherever God tells you to go? And it may be the ends of the earth, or it may be the end of your hallway in your apartment block. It may be to your neighbor. It may be to that colleague at work. And I actually feel this in my heart. It may be to that colleague at work who gives you a hard time all the time. Even to that person, are you willing to go? Because that can feel often harder than making a big decision about moving, just going in grace to them. And I wanted to speak, if I may, in my 33, 32, 31 seconds that I have left, to parents. I felt God lay on my heart for parents and for uncles and aunts here. If you, are, if you have kids or you have nieces, nephews, or you work in kids' work, you're in a school, wherever it is, actually your, your captivation of Christ is what will so into this next generation. We understand, actually, when we told Jonah and Mia, we sat them down with hot chocolate in a cafe, a bit of bribery always helps when you're breaking big news. And we said, we said God's asked us uh, to, uh, to, to move. We're going to be moving to Australia. Um, the most important question uh, that Jonah um, asked us was, has God told us to? And I was like, yeah, he's told us to go. And we were so convinced that he had. 
and that settled it. And there's pain, right? There's friendships, there's school, there's, there's, it's a cost. There's a cost that you have to count. But actually, we need to understand as those that minister to children that we are leading a multi-generational movement. That it's not just about us. You cannot expect your child to love God if you don't. You cannot expect your child to be captivated by Christ if you are yourself not captivated by Christ. Because as you look to Christ, as your focus is on him, actually their focus is already drawn. How many of you are looking at that grill right now? I'm looking at that grill right now, and you look up and you're looking at that grill. If I'm captivated, other people are captivated. If I am captivated, then my children are captivated. The responsibility is mine, and I must take that responsibility seriously. And I'm still working out, I'll be honest. I'm still working it out. In, um, in Numbers, uh, the book of Numbers, uh, God spoke to me about this, and I just wanted to share this really briefly, that actually when they took the census of all the people in Israel, 11 tribes they counted. They counted the 11 tribes by the fighting men over the age of 20. Okay? Then they got to the tribe of the Levites, and they counted them based on the children, the babies older than a month old. The people that minister towards God, the people that love God's presence, the people that will, uh, will take steps forward, the, te- the people that will be captivated by Jesus are those counted from a month onwards. We have an incredible responsibility as parents, uncles, aunts, and teachers to see those captivated by Christ. Amen? That's what we have. Why don't you stand for me, please? That would be great. I'm just going to pray for us as we end. Let's get the band up as well. That'd be great. Oh, Why don't you just close your eyes where you are? I feel just in my spirit, just reminded particularly of just this word undignified. If you, as your eyes are closed and just before Christ right now, if you know that you really struggle with what people think of you and that actually influences your decision making, it influences how you live your Christian life, would you just put your hand on your heart? You know this is you. You know this is a a bit of an issue. I feel like God just wants to break that right now. I feel he wants to just help you deal with that right now and move that to the side. Lord, I just, I pray for every person here who has their hand on their hearts. Lord, I pray you would help them to live undignified lives. irrespective of what people think, Lord. I pray for strength and I pray for courage, Lord. Lord, I pray for us all, Lord, that we would be captivated by you. Lord, we want to say that we love you. Amen, church? We want to say that we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Lord, I want to say that I am all yours. We want to say that we are all yours. If that is you, just... Say an amen under your breath that you are all God's. You belong to him fully. I'm yours, Lord. I thank you that you paid for me. I thank you that you set your seal of ownership on me. I thank you that I belong to you. I thank you that is my status before you, that I will be never be taken out of your hand. Lord, I want to walk for you. Lord, we want to walk for you. We want to follow you wherever you would take us. Whatever you would have us say, wherever we should go, we want to walk for you, captivated by you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord.